Hi, Aditya. How are you? I'm very well. How are you? Very good. Very good. Thank you so much for taking out the time. I think we'll wait for a couple of minutes. Yeah, yeah. Sure, no problem. Line, and then we'll have you on. So, what's your estimation in terms of the bounce back? How long will it take? I guess different uh, different answers for different industries in in some ways, and also the pattern will be will be different. Um, you know, some will surge back quite quickly. Uh, for example, e-commerce will surge back quite quickly, um, or, or for that matter, you know, there are some pockets of opportunity as well. But then anything that depends on a large amount of discretionary spending, that is that is definitely going to you know, take a beating. Take a beating, and I mean that that is bound to happen. Let's put my phone on silent. So, Aditya, shall we begin? I just introduce yes, you to everybody else, and then I really want you to talk to them about what we discussed the topic. Sure. So, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this webinar. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome Aditya Ghosh. I'm sure many, if not all of you, have had the pleasure of experiencing the services of the companies he's built, Indigo Airlines and Oyo Rooms now. Indigo's growth in particular was nothing short of a miracle. Entering India at a time when reliable, low-cost air travel was a distant dream, and Aditya was, I think, more than anyone else, instrumental in turning it into a phenomenal success. So much so that one in every two Indians who flies today does so on an Indigo plane. Our challenges at Vakil Search are similar, in fact, to the challenges they faced at Indigo. Uh, 50 million businesses, 1,300 million individuals hungry for reliable and affordable legal tax and compliance. And our goal is to make this a reality. And we, the dream team assembled here today, is going to make this happen. Interestingly, Aditya is a lawyer by training, so he's acutely aware of the challenges in our industry. But today, I want him to speak to us about, the, about life after the crisis. How do we use this adversity and come out stronger, both as individuals and as a company? So without any further ado, I'm going to hand it to Aditya. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, you know, the very first thing that um, I'd like to start off with is the fact that I think this whole crisis will will have four stages to it there is a stage of acknowledgement then there is a stage of survive uh, you know sort of uh, uh, containment then there is a stage of survival and only then there is a stage of recovery and it will happen in that sequence and that would basically mean that there will be that time that it takes for different industries and different countries to go through that cycle and you will not be able to sort of jump through, you know, or skip one of the one of the uh, uh, stages. But as basic as that sounds, you'll notice that how both as individuals and and many countries or markets have actually taken a long time to first acknowledge that we have an unprecedented crisis. And uh, countries that were able to, or even individuals who were able to acknowledge that we have a unprecedented uh, crisis were able to react and limit the impact of this crisis much better than those who tried to ignore it or were nonchalant about it now the reason i say that it is unprecedented is not you know just as a matter of of speech but actually that is exactly what it is because I mean, since the Ice Ages, uh, and, and the last Ice Age was about almost 18,000 years ago, um, the entire planet has not seen a crisis that has impacted it, whether it is a military crisis, whether it's an economic crisis, whether it is an environmental crisis. The human civilization as we know it has never seen a crisis like this where the entire world, every country, every geography has been impacted. Every industry has been impacted. So therefore, the very first thing that we must do is not make the mistake of comparing this with anything that we have seen in the past. This is not comparable to the you know, recession of 2008-9. This is not, oh, well, it is, it, you know, we, we can learn from it, but it is certainly not comparable or identical, or for that matter, the Great Depression or the World Wars or anything of that sort. That is important 
to acknowledge that because that will that will have an impact on how we take decisions about our future and how we take decisions or try to kind of predict how the world will move and how you know consumers will move and how we will move as individuals post this crisis um, the second thing is that even though we are going through a stage of containment and i know that patience is kind of running out in in many places uh, even, even amongst all of us uh, given the fact that the severe impact that it has had especially on uh, you know uh, migrant labor on daily wage earners on small and medium enterprises on early stage companies um we must realize that we will probably go through many starts and stops in this sort of you know period of lockdown and opening and lockdown again because it's not like whether it is the 18th of may or the 1st of june or whatever be the date that the lockdown finally gets lifted it's not like the virus has suddenly disappeared until the time that there is a vaccine that is universally available and at an affordable price and is being and has been delivered to two or three billion people around the world we are not going to see that suddenly you know the doors will open up and we'll go back to the way things were so so when when someone asks me this question that you know when do i see the bounce back i see it in in you know sort of you know ebbs and troughs over a sustained period of time and i'll come to that in in just a bit the next point that i need to make is that um, we depending on almost any industry actually in irrespective of any industry or any product or service that we will be in or that we are in one universal truth that i see is that the more affordable segment of the market the more affordable the offering of that product or service is that is definitely going to lead the recovery because if you were if you were in a business and if you started off a business the likelihood is and i hope like hell that we started off a business because we saw a fundamental need of the consumer that was not being met there was a gap in the market and that need has not disappeared people will still need to satisfy that need and there will be companies which will have to create a product and ser service to satisfy that need but people will also have just like companies will have people will also have a universal you know need to conserve cash the, so therefore whichever is the more affordable and uh, you know uh, uh, cheaper sort of you know product or service that is available but of of same or similar or comparable quality that product or service is definitely going to lead the recovery in every sector and every market there is only one exception the exception being that there is some absolutely unique scarcity or rarity value to it you know so you know to take a couple of examples uh, i mean there could be a city where there is only one flight a day but that person can obviously charge anything that that person wants right or or there is a senior counsel who is the only expert on a particular subject matter that person because of this rarity value the uniqueness of that offering can charge whatever they want but but that is going to be a very very thin slim layer which basically then creates an opportunity for people like yourselves people like indigo people like uh, oyo uh, or many of the other companies that i'm involved in where if we can take a product or a service and fix our cost structure and are able to you know provide that at a, a more affordable price then that's a sure shot way of garnering market share and the imagination of the consumer but for that to happen there are again two things that are very important 
one is internal internally one has to make sure that you are able to reinvent your business you are able to reinvent the way of working so that you are able to do two things one you are able to bring down your cost structure at a point where you are able to profitably uh, you know you can offer the product or service at that affordable price the second is that you are able to deliver the product or service with great amount of consistency so it doesn't matter whether you are the best or not or it doesn't matter whether you have some great days i always say pockets of excellence do not work pockets of excellence have to be recognized and they have to be replicated to create consistent levels of service so even if that means now coming to the external world even if that means that you have to cut down on the number of your promises but you say that this is what i stand for and this is what i am going to offer and i do it with great amount of consistency at that affordable price at that profitable you know level, at those profitable levels that is definitely going to be the the one which will give you that escape velocity out of this crisis and also you will be able to take advantage of this massive opportunity that you have and lastly you know in this we must remember two things what is not changing what is not changing is the need of the consumer the the consumer will still need the you know medical advice the consumer will still need education the consumer will still need legal advice but how you are addressing that need will change right the other thing that that should not change is that whatever are and i call them the unintended benefits there are certain unintended benefits that have come out of this crisis the air is cleaner people don't have to you know step out of home as much as they needed to right our pressure on the communities and the environment that we work in has reduced right the the there are many other opportunities like for example just because now the new normal will be work from home by and large because you'll have to ask yourself why did we need an office in the first place if life is okay right why am i paying actually you know the the lease rentals of this real estate so when that happens women for example many women who could not have taken job opportunities because of various other circumstances that they are usually subject to will be able to join the workforce from home there will be many people who are so called retired right or are getting to the close of retirement with life expectancy where it is today the age of 60 is nothing and you'll suddenly have access to a pool of workforce which is highly experienced which may be available at a lower cost who can work out of home there are many unintended benefits that have come out of this crisis so how do we make sure that as a community as a nation or as a world at large we do not lose these unintended benefits because we want to go back to the way things were actually i do not want to go back to the way things were you know and not not neither should each one of us you know go back to the way things were as individuals i'll speak for myself i find myself far more productive at home i i'm i'm glad i'm not stuck in traffic in various places i'm able to dedicate time to things that i always wanted to dedicate time to right along with you know taking on a lot more work so 
irrespective of how you see it as as an individual self as an organization as a community as a nation we have enough opportunities to learn from this crisis and become better as businesses um like i said the very first thing has to be that um we have to reassess our method of working and in some cases maybe even in even in the all kind of business this is the so called demonetization moment you know there because because there are many things which the consumer behavior would have taken much longer to to change will change much faster because of necessity even in many of our homes we may have bought a book online we may have bought a power bank online we may have bought a t-shirt online we may have bought uh, i don't know uh, some exotic uh, you know food item online but were we buying a a dozen bananas a a a, a bucket of curd a piece of chocolate rice atta dal online most of us were not certainly our parents generation were not but all that has changed people are buying 10 rupees worth or 50 rupees worth of medicine also online now right schools and colleges which which used to say that no actually physical presence of the teacher and the student and all of that was very important which it is have overnight pivoted to doing classes on zoom now i'm not that is one end of the pendulum and what way the way we were was the other end of the pendulum but those who can use this change in consumer behavior to their advantage it is their demonetization moment who is a consumer is now saying yeah i bought it i'm comfortable doing this now i'm comfortable using my debit card my upi my you know my credit card or whatever it is and my you know my hesitation of privacy my hesitation of do i need to touch the cabbage and see whether i should buy that cabbage or not all that is gone right so there will be opportunities there as well uh and uh, and therefore like you know i i and i have seen this even in my past in the you know after the 2008 9 crisis um when i was running indigo at that time uh 2010 11 12 were the absolutely glory years of indigo uh because we were, and and we continue to grow from there and we turn profitable and things like that whereas those competitors who had high cost structures they fell by the wayside and have disappeared the same thing is happening even today so so you have to see that are you reliant on that very high discretionary spending of the consumer or are you being able to tailor your product or service at the price point that they and the last thing is that you know and i wrote this i wrote an article on this in the fortune i do not think this was a black swan event a black swan event is something where you it is beyond the realm of imagination this was not beyond the realm of imagination people had predicted it but we did not pay attention to it i am not at all saying that one could have predicted that it will be the corona virus from wuhan at this point in time that nobody can there are no guarantees in life but those who ran their businesses keeping in mind that there is going to be a storm some day were able to limit their their impact of how it happened you look at two neighboring countries france and italy because of the kind of disaster recovery and national you know anti terrorism response uh, systems that they had in france 
the moment the hospitals in paris started getting were overflowing and were running out of capacity they immediately had trains running with medical facilities with stretchers and the whole whole nine yards and they started pushing out patients to hospitals in other cities on their high speed railway right now all of that takes time it takes money it takes consciousness so when when you know when i said this there's a lot of my peers and colleagues who said no but that that's impossible i mean you can't you can't you know sort of uh, you know safeguard against every wrinkle in the carpet and i do understand that but then whether it was whether it is a corona virus or whether it is an economic crisis or whether it is a flood or a tsunami or a earthquake we do not know what the crisis will be but is it beyond the realm of imagination that you might get hit by a some kind something where you're out for one month and how does your company run right so i think going forward boards as well as investors certainly the more savvy ones will take a different lens or should take a different lens at uh, at how we look at risk and how we look at future planning because the last thing that i'll say is that the companies which are filing for bankruptcy the companies which are in trouble they are not in trouble because of what has happened in the last two months the crisis has only magnified their inefficiency because when times are good every donkey looks like a horse it is only when there is a crisis that the you know the the sores in your body kind of really so yeah. uh, thank you so much that was very helpful there has been some comments chats which have been sent to me while you were talking so from a business perspective you know very sage advice very useful advice the questions which have come to me are really around you know we as individuals so we have 380 people in the company and for us to really bounce back and get out of this stronger uh, we'll have to figure out how to be the most productive how to be the most relevant selves versions of ourselves so it will require upskilling of ourselves through learning through through training through courses maybe it will require how to you know getting to being productive when you are in a office environment where everyone sort of doing things there are targets on the wall and so on and so forth is a very different story from being productive when you are in the confines and comfort of your own home so what is your what are your suggestions to all of us uh in terms of a being the most productive versions of ourselves being the most you know fulfilled versions of ourselves and some of the things that you are doing uh to to learn to maybe read to upskill yourself so that when you come out of this crisis this time has actually been a time you look back at with maybe satisfaction if not with joy uh so you know i am extremely calm and i'm actually enjoying this uh uh you know period of lockdown tremendous and i don't i'm not saying this because it's a sound like a cool thing to say and i am not saying it in a frivolous or flippant manner the reason for that is that you know the very first thing that we have to do is again acknowledge the fact that you are healthy the fact that the loved ones around you do not need any critical health care the fact that you have a roof above your head and you today have two square meals a day itself puts us in a very fortunate position and we should not forget that and we should not take that for granted it's very important you know because it immediately you know makes sure that we are not seeing ourselves as as victims or anything of that sort you know that's item number 1 item number 2 is that one has to ask themselves and one has to ask you know i i I've, i've been doing that for quite a few years now you have to ask yourself what is it that gives you intrinsic happiness you know what is it that makes you who you are and for at least i'll speak for myself my work alone is not what makes me 
happy and it doesn't define who I am. And I'm very comfortable with that fact. And I kind of enjoy that fact. I enjoy the fact that, and I have no harm in acknowledging that I'm actually a very multidimensional person. Actually, most of us are. We shy away from it. So uh, when I put, I'll give you an example. Where if you I have like thousands and tens of thousands of followers on Instagram and, and this, that. So in all of this, most people will think, you know, what am I, if I put this, if I don't put this, you know, what will people think and all of that kind of stuff. I don't care. It's a slice of my life. So I'll give, I'll give you a live example. Some, some weeks back, I put up an um, um, a Instagram post of something that I had made in the kitchen. I'd cooked. And, uh, and somebody sent me a message saying that, uh, you know, you're a, I'm a big fan of yours, but you're a big influencer. And you're very powerful and this, that, and the other. But, and therefore, I don't think that at these times when people don't have anything to eat, you should be putting out things, which is a food related post. And I said that, you know, I'm not quite sure how to react to that. Because does that mean that till the time that even one person who goes hungry in a population of whatever, five to six billion people in the world, you will not, you know, have anything to eat or you won't tell anybody that you're eating something. You have to find joy in the smallest things and yet be equally sensitive to what others are doing. But the very first step of that is to get comfortable with who you are and whether you are comfortable with being who you are. So I just gave you my son is here. So yeah, so um, and and so therefore, the, and for example, I had been because of the very hectic you know professional life that I've had for a long period of time. Um, I wanted to spend time with my children. I wanted to spend time at home. I wanted to spend uh, time reading. I wanted to spend time writing. I wanted to you know, go back to my workout in a serious way. I wanted to watch, you know, a bunch of films that I really hadn't watched for a long period of time, you know, because all of those things are my interest. I wanted to work on the, you know, my, my kind of charitable foundation that, that, that I, that I, that I have or that I work with. So this time is not going to come back, you know, so that's item number one. So to make it useful, it does not mean that I have to only do a course that will help me professionally. You could be very, very happy if you spend time with your parents or your loved ones and say, you know, I did spend quality time, which I did not have all this while. And I got to know my parents much better, or I got to know my spouse better, or I got to know my children better. That is absolutely okay. And that is time really, really well spent. Professionally, at work, if that's the question, then the very first thing that we have to remember is that we have to be agile. We cannot force our previous self into these new abnormal circumstances, which basically means that life has changed, circumstances have changed, so I have to change also. So if I was the one who was um, let's say an offline sales guy and now I have to do more online sales, then so be it. If I was a person who was in the stores and I have to now manage the call center, so be it. You know, So to that extent, we've got to be agile and we've got to be nimble and we've got to do whatever it takes, which is in the best interest of the company, which will also add a lot more value and skills and experience to me as a person. And in that, of course, if you if there is a course that you've always wanted to do and you never had the time to take a sabbatical, and there was a subject that you were very weak on, 
or you are not most confident on. This is a great time to do that. So, so um, I think, I think, um, I think making the most out of this in, in a multidimensional way is what will give somebody the most amount of satisfaction. Thank you so much. There are a couple of questions, one publicly and a couple of questions privately. I know we're running out of time. Yep. So uh, one question is, you know, what was the biggest challenge you faced and overcame? And maybe you can give us the anecdote. And the other questions which I've got privately are, uh, again, in line with the professional question I asked you, any productivity hacks that you're using, you know, to, to get yourself into the zone, if you will, or to get yourself into the mood where you can really bring out your best productive work while being at home, while being in the comfort of your own home. Uh, those are the two questions. And, and one more question is, it's, it's again an anecdote, but any book or any specific skill that you are personally trying to master or learn in this time. So I know we're running out of time. So no, that's okay. Questions and we'll uh, so so I'll, um, the productivity hack is basically just sit with a blank piece of paper and dream and put down and make a list of all the things that you want to do or want to accomplish or want to at least put a, you know, put your hand to it. You want to dip your toes into it, experiment. Just put all of those back down on a piece of paper. Then say that, okay, I've got seven days and try to work out a bit of a schedule, a bit of a routine. That, that also means that, yeah, you know, I really want to sleep one hour in the afternoon, right? So be it. Put that down in that list and try, try to come up with a routine and try to stick to that routine. Because now you have no, no excuse, right? It's not like I was stuck in traffic or something of that sort. The routine is what you make for yourself and you stick to that. And I think you will be able to, because you're making the choices for yourself, you'll feel much more at peace if you're able to follow that routine. So at least that I've found to be extremely helpful for me. The second is that, uh, you know, on, on um, what, what, what is the kind of book or, you know, something that I'm, I'm actually, I've been, you know, there was a bunch of stuff that I've been wanting to read for a long period of time. So I'm just kind of alternating between, uh, you know, fiction and nonfiction, you know, and, and my, I, my target is, uh, although I'm a little bit ahead of the target, but my target is I should finish one book a week. So, uh, so I'm, I'm doing that and I'm sharing those experiences on my Instagram, etc. So that's, that's another thing. Uh, I've, I've been wanting to, uh, to uh, up my workout level. So I've, I've, I'm doing that, right? So just before this, uh, I, 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 did a, I did a long workout in the morning and I just finished an hour's cardio and I, and I quickly had a shower and, and then, then I logged in for this. So, you know, today was a checkbox. Uh, um, the, 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 the anecdote in terms of some of the biggest challenges, look, uh, I've always been in very, very tough businesses. So every day there were many, many challenges. But the one which kind of really uh, challenged me psychologically um, and, uh, and I had to dig deep to get a lot of strength to deal with that is, if you remember two and a half years ago, there was this one, only one customer service incident that happened at the Delhi airport at, at Indigo. And, uh, and even though we were not at fault, technically, and even though that little boy who got hit, you know, um, it was not his fault, but the world didn't see it that. And, and anyway, bad news travels fast. Anyway, WhatsApp forwards are like the bane of every company. But what was, what was, what was extremely disheartening for us and challenging for me was that from for, for, for 10 years, you know, we had been this darling of the Indian industry, this poster child of, you know, of, of uh, you know, all that is good and a great brand and you know, a most admired company. And then one incident and everybody started putting a question mark. You know? uh, so it was very, very hard to see why are people saying this? Don't they know us? They experience us every day, but then why are they doing this to us? And then it took me a while for me to realize, and then I kind of, you know, send out a long, uh, well, not so long, but a shortish email to all my colleagues. And I said, you know, I know it's a tough time for all of us because we're just so 
passionate about the organization that we have built. And we are asking this question, why? But actually, that's the wrong question to ask. Who knows why somebody's saying? Somebody's motivated, somebody is taking out some other frustration, somebody's just having fun, you know, who knows why? The really question, the real question to ask when somebody criticizes you is what they are saying. And then if they're saying 10 things, examine them very closely and say, you know, is there even an iota of truth in what they're saying? And if there is, take that one piece and then improve upon it so that you can start tending to be perfect. And that I think brought about a lot of strength and courage within the organization. And of course the organization came out stronger and better and continues to be one of the most admired brands in, in, in the country. So I think that is something definitely out of the many, many, many other challenges of fuel prices and economy and dollar and this, that and the other, and, and you know, shortage and all of that. I think that was the one uh, which really tested my mettle to see, can I, lead an organization of 14, 15,000 people and keep them motivated and, and deal with, with something like this. Thank you, Aditya. There are about 15 more questions, but I know we're running out of time. So thank you so much for taking my pleasure. time. I think it's I, I, you know, I, you know, please feel uh, uh, free to stay in touch on Instagram. And, and I'm usually pretty good at you know, answering uh, comments there and things like that. So uh, I, I'm sure, or you would find some of the answers to many of these questions in my posts, etc. So yeah, absolutely. So there you go, everybody, uh, please reach, feel free to reach out to Aditya. He said so, he said so himself. So take the liberty of reaching out to him on Instagram if you like his post. Or I'm sure you can gain a lot of wisdom there as well. Uh, right. We will, Aditya, look at this as an opportunity. We are continuing to do so. And uh, yes. you know, your words today have been uh, more than inspiring. I think they've been, uh, they've been, they've opened some eyes, and they've definitely been comforting. So thank you once again for the time. Wish, wish you all the very best, Rishkesh. Wish, you, wish so you all the very best. Go ahead and change the world. And thank you guys for joining in. Get 300 plus services. Chat and email with our team directly. Get stunning discounts and rewards. Only on Wakil Search app. Download now.